Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. Um, my name is Melissa, and I work with the National Ocean Sciences Bowl in the National Office in Washington, D.C., and I really appreciate you all joining us today. Um, it's different this year. Now that everyone's used to Zoom, I can see some of you on your cameras. Um, nice to see many of you that I recognize. Um, I will ask that during the presentation, um, I have you muted upon entry, but I'll ask, also ask if you can turn off your video just so that we can conserve bandwidth um, so we don't interfere with the presenter's actual presentation. So while it was nice to see you, um, we can talk again at the end. Okay. Um, so today we have a webinar as part of our professional development webinar series. We do this every year with the NOSB specifically for our coaches. Uh, we like to prepare their students for competition. Um, and this is one way they can learn about our theme for each year and then take the information back to their students. But we also encourage all educators to join us because we know that you can take the lessons that you learn from this webinar and also infuse them into your classrooms no matter what you teach. The theme this year is plunging into our polar oceans. Um, so the presentations you're going to get during this webinar series are gonna be mostly about the Arctic and they are including individuals who worked in the Mosaic Expedition, which I know most of our presenters are going to talk a little bit about that as well. Um, you can find the webinar schedule on our website. It's just nosb.org. Um, and you can also find this information if you follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll be posting everything there as well. The agenda for today is we're going to have up to an hour presentation and then 30 minutes for Q&A. Um, like I said, I'm going to ask you to remain muted. So any questions that you have throughout the presentation, just please feel free to enter them into the chat box and you can enter them at any point during the presentation, but I will read them aloud to our presenter at the very end. And we're going to have up to 30 minutes for questions. So we'll get through as many as possible. Um, I'd also like to ask that if you enjoy these presentations, if you could please provide us feedback. For the coaches, you'll have a uh, post-regional bowl survey that you can provide information. For those who aren't associated with the NOSB, you can always email us at nosb at oceanleadership.org. We'd really love to hear from you um, about how you're using the information you learned from these webinars and what you found useful in them, uh, mostly because it helps us retain funding for this series. Okay, so today we have a guest expert, Carolyn Harris. She's currently pursuing her PhD at Dartmouth College. And today she's going to present on sea ice, which serves as a haven for Arctic marine life. So I'm just going to turn it over to her now. Great, thank you. Okay, if you cannot see my slides, um, then give me like a thumbs down or something, but I think this should be working. Um, so thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here um, and be part of the National Ocean Sciences Bowl this year. I wish I knew about this community when I was in high school as kind of a lifelong aficionado of marine science. I think I would have really loved participating in it. Um, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about the Mosaic Expedition and what it can teach us about Arctic marine ecosystems. Um, and so I'm really excited to kind of talk about the expedition itself and then also talk about marine ecosystems and food webs, which is really kind of my passion within science. So just to give you a little bit of background information about myself, I'm currently pursuing a PhD at Dartmouth College in the Earth Sciences Department. Um, I'm also a member of the Mosaic Biogeochemistry team and an outreach ambassador for the expedition. Um, I have a master's degree in marine science from the University of Texas at Austin, and I've spent the last eight years doing field research in um, the Arctic and in Antarctica. So I'm really excited to get to talk to you about polar science today, although we're going to specifically talk about the Arctic. 
So a brief outline of the talk. Um, before I dive into talking about how sea ice supports a diverse and productive food web in one of the harshest environments on the planet, namely the Central Arctic Ocean, um, I first want to speak a little bit about the mosaic expedition itself, uh, the motivation for it, the logistics of it, um, and what researchers have and hope to learn um, from the data collected during it. Um, so as you'll learn in a second, the sheer scale of the expedition in terms of the personnel involved and the logistics and the research goals is just super impressive. Um, so I want to uh, do justice to, to the scale of this expedition uh, before we move into talking a little bit more about the science. Um, so I understand that in some of the future seminar series, you'll be he hearing from other people who participated in the Mosaic Expedition. So I'm glad to get to kind of be the first one to introduce the expedition. So it is the largest Arctic expedition in history. The name itself is an acronym. It's the Multidisciplinary Drifting Observatory for the Study of Arctic Climate, uh, which I know is kind of a mouthful and it's also a little bit of a stretch as an acronym, but I'm just gonna refer to it as Mosaic from here on out. Um, so this initiative was really spearheaded by the Alfred Wegener Institute in Germany, but it involves many, many international collaborators and eventually involved about 20 countries. And so the main goal of the expedition um, was fairly simple in, in goal, but um, obviously very complex to enact. So the goal was to spend a year drifting in the Arctic Ocean, trapped in the sea ice, to study the impacts of global warming on the Arctic Ocean. So obviously an expedition of this scale um, had to have good justification to happen. And so the main justification is that the Arctic is the epicenter of climate change. Um, it's experiencing amplified warming, which means that the Arctic is warming twice as fast as the mid-latitudes. You can see that illustrated in this figure here where uh, the parts of the globe shown in red are warming um, faster uh, than other parts. And so the Arctic is just one continuous band where um, for about every degree the mid-latitudes warm, uh, the Arctic warms two degrees. And so the consequences of this warming, um, one of the main ones is that the sea ice, which is really the main characteristic of the Arctic Ocean, um, is rapidly being lost. And so this means that during the summer, the sea ice is melting at unprecedented rates. Um, and during the winter, it's not forming or growing as much, which means that um, large parts of the Arctic Ocean that used to be uh, covered in sea ice during the winter are now ice free. And so this figure is showing sea ice extent um, uh, over time in the different seasons uh, relative to an average, for a 30 year average. So this blue line um, is showing data for 2020 up through November. And you can see that it's another unprecedented year in terms of minimal sea ice extent. Another motivation is that right now climate models um, are not very good at predicting warming specifically in the Arctic. And part of this is because the climate linkages within the Arctic between uh, the ocean and the water column and the sea ice and the atmosphere are not well understood. So what this figure is showing is the uncertainty in um, climate models by latitude. Um, so uh, what it's showing us is that um, if you look at uh, the up near the Arctic from 60 to 90 degrees, the uncertainty is about five to 15 degrees Celsius in terms of how much warming will occur by 2100 under a, a business as usual uh, carbon emission scenario. Um, and so the models that do a much better job uh, constraining those predictions at some of the lower latitudes. So there's really um, a, um, like an immediate need for year round observations that will help better parameterize these climate models so that we can better predict and understand how warming is going to affect the Arctic and give us the chance to mitigate some of these consequences for the ecosystems and for the life that lives in the Arctic. Uh, so the Mosaic expedition took an enormous amount of work uh, to, to make it happen, which is why some news outlets have referred to it as the moon landing of the 21st century. Um, it took over a decade of international planning and 
from the beginning, uh, the focus was to be interdisciplinary. So rather than just go out and specifically study um, one aspect of the ecosystem, the idea was to really study every different facet and the connections between them um, to be able to uh, use these observations to integrate them into climate models in a way that's going to improve our predictive power. Um, and along with that, another very important part is to capture a continuous seasonal cycle from freezing during the fall and winter to melting during the summer to then freezing again. Um, it's very hard to capture year-round data in the central Arctic Ocean just because it's such, such a harsh environment. Um, so in order to do that, they needed a really robust ship to, to be sent out there and freeze into the ice. Um, and so that ship is the RV Polar Stern. This is a German research icebreaker. Um, that was the main ship used during the Mosaic expedition. Um, so it performed year round operations from September, 2019, when the expedition started until this past October when it ended. Um, and so having this icebreaker that was able to withstand um, really thick ice in the central Arctic Ocean um, up to about 1.5 meters thick was really critical to the success of the mission. Um, and then it in and of itself also needed to be um, like really a, a floating laboratory and home to hundreds of researchers and technicians and crew members who all lived and worked aboard the ship. Um, I, so although the, mission, the expedition itself lasted um, a full year, the personnel was swapped out by other support ships um, every few months. So the first part of this uh, expedition was sailing from uh, Tromsø, Norway in Scandinavia out uh, towards the North Pole where the search for a suitable ice flow began. And it was unexpectedly challenging to find uh, a suitable ice flow to start the expedition. And that's because the ice was even thinner than um, people expected for uh, September, which is really the beginning of the freezing period. Um, so this figure is showing sea ice anomaly of uh, last year, 2019, relative to the decade prior. So anything shown in red was thinner than the, than the average for the previous decade. So you can see that this whole area um, out near the central Arctic Ocean, kind of on the coast, uh, um, offshore the coast of Russia, was much thinner than expected. Um, and so the the dashed area is where uh, the polar stern and some of the other equipment eventually was uh, set up. So the polar stern wasn't completely alone. Um, researchers established observational sites kind of set up in a ring around the polar stern that's referred to as the distributed network. And so the distributed network includes autonomous and remotely operated sensors and buoys. Um, some of these were deployed um, on the sea ice itself. So they're either taking measurements on the surface of the ice or within the ice. Um, some of them, uh, we drilled holes in the ice and deployed instruments in the water column below. Um, and then some of them were set up on platforms on the sea ice and are taking measurements in the atmosphere. And so this kind of distributed network of sensors is really important to help characterize the heterogeneity and variability of um, kind of all of these different characteristics of the Arctic ecosystem rather than just taking measurements at the polar stern itself. And so this is going to be super helpful for researchers to be able to understand and parameterize um, kind of these small to medium scale variations within the sea ice. And this information can be used in climate models that currently um, have rather big grid cells for them. So this information will help parameterize sub grid scale uh, processes within the climate models. Um, so the distributed network was set up by a support icebreaker that accompanied the polar CERN um, in its search for a suitable ice flow um, right at the beginning of the mission. And so this is the leg of the expedition that I was on. So I wanted to show you um, a few uh, photos um, and kind of schematics of what this entailed because it was a pretty huge undertaking that involved uh, multiple helicopters supporting researchers. 
um, tons of heavy equipment being uh, craned down onto the sea ice surface, um, and then just lots of uh, kind of human hours put into uh, taking various samples to characterize the ice glow and make sure that we were um, picking sites where the equipment would not only function for the, uh, the next year, but also be safe for people to be out and walking around on. So kind of the first step of this was ice flow mapping. Um, so we had to map all of the ice flows that either people and or equipment was going to be deployed on. So helping with this effort was one of my main jobs during the expedition. So this image on the left shows a radar view of a candidate ice flow that we would look at. Um, and then the one on the right is a schematic of um, where different pieces of equipment were proposed to be deployed. So that orange, um, triangle thing uh, represents the, the icebreaker itself, and then all the different blue points are where uh, we planned to deploy equipment, but we needed to make sure that the ice was thick enough both for people to walk around on and then also for equipment to be deployed on and thick enough that we could drill through that ice to deploy some of our equipment. And so the way that was done was with kind of two main methods. Um, so the first step was to, to measure the ice thickness and then the snow thickness on top of the ice. Um, Cause sometimes, you know, when you have a snow cover on the ice, it's really hard to tell just by looking um, kind of what the characteristic of the ice is, like if it was really weak and brittle or if it was pretty strong and thick. Um, on average, this ice was about a meter and a half thick. So it can easily support um, the weight of people, but the weight of all of our equipment was a whole other story. So first we had to walk around it um, using these two methods. So the first is uh, taking continuous ice thickness measurements by what's called a ground electromagnetic method or the GEM. Um, and so this is what um, this woman is dragging around on a sled here. Um, and then the other was taking point measurements with an instrument called a magnaprobe. Um, so that's what this woman is carrying here. And so she, uh, every few steps, will place that um, staff on the ground and pull a trigger and it will take a measurement of both the ice thickness and the snow thickness. Um, and so in this kind of fashion, um, these two would just walk a zigzagging path around the whole ice flow and we would end up with some data that looks like this. Um, where kind of the X and Y coordinates are the uh, longitude and latitude, and then um, the colored bars represent either the snow thickness or the ice thickness. Um, and so you can see that it can be quite variable even um, within the small distances. Um, so it was really important both for safety and for science to characterize this flow wherever equipment was going to be deployed. Um, a second part of this was to take ice cores, which were going to help characterize the biology and chemistry of the sea ice. And so this was done by drilling into the ice um, to take up a core sample. So I have a quick video of that. Um, so I'll play this again. This is team lead uh, Michael Angelopoulos taking an ice core um, where you can see this core barrel drilling into the ice um, and then as he reaches the bottom of the ice water starts to be pulled up and spewed out. And so um, after uh, he has the core in the core barrel, we would uh, extrude it and then we would um, just observe the ice itself, which can actually tell us a lot about the um, kind of the quality of the ice just by looking at it. Um, so things we're looking for is any brittle sections that might have a lot of air bubbles or have a lot of channels in them. So in this example, you can see um, that the ice has been really uh, heavily channelized here, which um, is the down core side, so the side closest to the ice water interface, um, whereas up in the higher sections there's some air bubbles and then there's some um, inclusions here of these kind of dark things that look like they might be sediment um, that are more towards the, the surface of the, of the ice flow. Um, and so once these cores were described, we would bring them into the lab we would section them by sawing off um, chunks 
And then we would melt those individual chunks and then we would analyze the resulting water um, for various geochemical parameters, um, which would provide really useful information um, when it came time to try to identify what the origin of the ice flow was. And by that, I mean, um, you know, we found this ice flow out in the Central Arctic, kind of close to the North, North Pole, but where did the ice itself form? Um, so I will come back to that and show you that data a little bit later. So the main goal of this uh, drifting experiment is to let nature be the navigator and just travel across the North Flow, the, the North Pole, excuse me, um, as a natural ice flow would. Um, so this map is showing the, the path the polar stern took. Um, this first part here is when uh, the ship was under its own power, just motoring out to get to the starting point here. So it launched from Norway, went uh, past Russia and Siberia, um, up near uh, the Central Arctic. And so in general, um, we were expecting it to follow the kind of transpolar drift, which is where sea ice typically forms um, somewhere in this region off the coast of Siberia, and then flows past the North Pole, uh, past the North Pole towards the Fram Strait, where typically um, in the spring, sea ice is getting spit out of the Fram Strait here. Um, so overlaid on top of this is the uh, kind of different stages of uh, the mosaic drift. So this first stage is where the ship was freezing in, um, distributed network was being set up and they were getting ready for the expedition. Um, then in yellow is where uh, they were really experiencing the heart of the Arctic winter. So during this time they were in 24 hour darkness referred to as the polar night. Um, so the sun never rose and all of their operations outside the ship were done in complete darkness. Um, then towards the tail end of winter, they experienced this period of uh, rapid transport where the ship moved quite a lot in just a few months. And then in June during the summer melt, um, the ship actually uh, exited the sea ice kind of um, by Svalbard in, in the Fram Strait um, a little bit faster than than uh, the cruise leaders were hoping. So they actually ended up resetting and um, motoring back out towards the North Pole to kind of uh, capture the onset of winter and the winter freeze up period again. Um, and so then the expedition ended um, in October of this past year. And so I just wanna show a few highlights by the numbers of um, kind of the main parts of this uh, expedition. So in total, it lasted 389 days. It involved seven icebreakers and ships, uh, one of which was the Polar Stern, and then the other six of which were support ships that went out to resupply and do personnel exchanges. Um, there were 442 scientists and experts and crew people involved, um, over 20 countries. Uh, the closest the ship ever got to the North Pole was 156 kilometers. Um, in total, it drifted um, 3,400 kilometers in a really zigzagging path across the ocean that I just showed. And um, over the course of the year, they saw more than 60 polar bears. And the coldest temperature recorded was about negative 42 degrees Celsius, which is pretty cold. So one of the things that made Mosaic um, unique and so valuable is that it was so multidisciplinary in scope. And these disciplines were broken down into five categories um, that really worked together to achieve the science goals. And so those disciplines were atmosphere, ocean, sea ice, ecosystem, and biogeochemistry. And so this expedition patch here is meant to represent the five disciplines and the interactions between them. So I was part of the biogeochemistry team, which worked closely with the ecosystem team. Um, so I wanna focus on those areas of research next. Um, since this expedition just ended, um, tons of data is still coming in from them um, and being analyzed. So there isn't a, a ton of published yet from, from Mosaic, um, but I am gonna talk about uh, one of the first papers to be published um, and then some of the goals of the research uh, that was done on board. Okay, so I wanna take a moment and zoom out. So I've been talking a lot about what it was like to live and work for people um, in the Central Arctic Ocean 
throughout the polar winter where we had this cozy ship that was heated and well lit to come back to at the end of our days working on the ice. Um, but I want to think about what it's like for all of the animals and marine life that call uh, the Central Arctic home. Um, so from this perspective, the Central Arctic is one of the most extreme and inhospitable habitats on the planet. Uh, animals that live there have to cope with months of complete darkness, water temperatures that are near freezing during the summer and can be below freezing during winter, and sea ice cover that can last for a large part of the year, if not the entire year, which really limits the amount of light um, that is able to reach the water column. And then um, below that sea ice, the, the benthos is four kilometers away. So it's a really deep ocean relative to some of the coastal Arctic seas that are uh, pretty shallow. And then on top of all that, we have these uh, new challenges that life has to overcome, which are mainly um, the rapid warming and then a rapid change, rapid ecosystem change that comes along with that warming. Um, so one of the main goals of the ecosystems team on Mosaic was to determine the food web response to these changes and also to understand how uh, the food web and the individual species within the web um, function to withstand this extreme environment year round. So in particular, many of these species haven't been well studied during the polar night um, throughout like the, the Arctic winter um, or in the central Arctic ocean. And so it's kind of unknown how their function might differ from some of the coastal Arctic seas that are a lot better studied. So despite the harsh conditions, the Arctic is home to a diversity of fauna, um, some of which are shown here. So there's just tons of really cool critters from tiny plankton um, all the way up to, of course, the uh, characteristic imposing polar bear. Um, so before I dive into some data, I just wanna also take a moment and say that the Arctic is full of surprises. And one of my favorite ones um, on the Mosaic cruise was seeing this bioluminescence. Um, so while we were heading from Norway um, out towards the North Pole to start the expedition, we came across this huge bloom of bioluminescent fauna. So what this picture is showing is um, several people's heads peeking over the stern of the ship um, and just watching the bioluminescence as it was getting churned up by the, the ship's motor um, as we were motoring around. Um, and we weren't able to stop to take a, a sample. So we still don't know exactly um, what organism was causing the bloom. It could have been dinoflagellates, it could have been tinafores, or it could have been something else entirely. And we will never know for sure. And I just think that it's such a cool um, kind of moment of intrigue um, that really reminds me of why the Arctic is special and why it's important to understand this um, really fragile ecosystem. So the main links in the central Arctic food web are already well known to scientists. Um, at the base of the food web are ice algae, which are consumed by zooplankton and other small crustaceans, which are eaten by Arctic cod. These cod in turn are eaten by seals, um, which are finally consumed by polar bears, the top predator of the system. But much is still unknown about how these individual species and their connections will be affected by warming and sea ice loss. So next I wanna uh, zoom in on a few of these um, components of the food web and talk about what we can learn from them um, from Mosaic. So first, ice algae. Um, ice algae are super important in the Central Arctic Ocean. They are the base of the food web and provide about 50% of primary production. Um, they colonize brine channels in the ice. So as sea ice forms, they leave the water column, go up into these little pockets of high salinity uh, liquid water within the sea ice matrix itself um, and live there. And some of them exhibit what's called mixotrophy. So during the um, summer, when there is some light that can penetrate through the ice, they perform photosynthesis and act as autotrophs. But then during the long, uh, dark Arctic winter, um, they switch their metabolism and become heterotrophs and start consuming some of the other microbes that are living in that, um, the, that brine channel matrix in the bottom of the sea ice. So sometimes when you take sea ice cores, you see this characteristic like brownish 
layer um, at the bottom of the core. And so that is where um, ice algae, mainly diatoms, have colonized the ice and are living right at that ice water interface. Um, and so not only are these um, ice algae important to kind of the macro food web of the system, they also fuel what's um, like a, a microbial food web within the ice and possibly within the water column. So these diatom aggregates form at the bottom of the ice. And so these images at the top are showing um, kind of different types of diatom aggregates that form. And then the images on the bottom are microscope images of the individual species comprising that colony. And so these can break off from the ice and sink down and kind of fuel this floating microbial food web. Um, and right now their role in carbon export from kind of the surface ocean to the deep ocean is really unclear. And so that's an active area of research. Um, the other half of primary production in the central Arctic comes from plankton that live in the water column. And so um, previous research has shown that planktonic production is increasing in the coastal Arctic Ocean. So this figure is showing um, uh, changes in phytoplankton production um, as measured by chlorophyll A concentration, which is a proxy for phytoplankton biomass um, over the last several years. So just to orient you, we have Scandinavia down here, Greenland here, Alaska, and then uh, Russia over here. So anywhere that's shown in red is where uh, phytoplankton are increasing. But this area in black that comprises most of the Central Arctic Ocean, there's no data on. Um, and this is a very recent paper from 2020. So being able to fill in some of these data gaps um, is going to be super useful to understanding how um, the, the plankton in the Central Arctic Ocean are changing in response to warming. Um, and this is also important because we um, knowing the timing of these blooms is going to be important to know how they are matching up with some of the other species in the system. Um, for example, the plankton might be blooming, um, which you might think is a great food source for zooplankton, but if the timing of the plankton bloom is off from when the zooplankton um, start their life cycle, then it's not going to actually result in more energy in the food web. Next up is one of my favorites, the Arctic cod or Boreogatus seda. Um, so this is a really small but really abundant fish. It's only about five to 10 centimeters long, um, but it's super important. It's the main prey item of seals and seabirds. Um, and it has developed these cool adaptations for life in the ice. So um, the juveniles actually seek shelter under the, the sea ice and they might actually be dispersing with the sea ice. Um, so a recent paper uh, looked at this where this map is showing um, all of the black circles are areas where they collected Arctic cod and then they um, used uh, this tool called sea ice backtracking to kind of backtrack where the ice where they um, collected these cod might have originated. And so each colored path here connects a black dot, which is the fish, to a white dot, which is where the sea ice the fish was associated with um, may have originated. And so we can see that this area by Siberia um, looks like it's a really important um, kind of spawning ground for cod where they might have started their journey towards the central Arctic Ocean where they then uh, fuel um, this food web with these characteristic marine mammals like seals and um, polar bears. And so this is a really cool method, method to trace spawning grounds. And uh, Mosaic is gonna really help our ability to do this by tracing the food sources that these cod use all year round and kind of seeing how the quality of them might change. Um, so right now we know that uh, cod are getting about 50% of um, their food, which they then turn into biomass like mussel, liver, and gonads um, from sea ice algae. And so knowing um, the kind of seasonal progression of this will be super important. So now I want to um, kind of going along with that, we've done this sort of backtracking um, style analysis with the mosaic flow. 
Um, so this map is showing out here is where um, the Polar Star and the Distributed Network were set up in September 2019. And then um, the different colors show a backtrack going back through time to determine where that flow might have originated. And so just like um, those other researchers found with the polar cod originating near Siberia, um, that's exactly where the mosaic flow uh, probably originated. And so another piece of evidence that uh, supports this is this characteristic sediment layer that we found in all of the ice cores we took, or in most of the ice cores we took, um, which means that the ice flow probably originated in a shallow coastal zone, um, such as the Siberian coast. And finally, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about polar bears. I love polar bears. Um, they were one of the species I looked at for my master's work, which was in um, the Eastern Beaufort Sea. Um, so I would be remiss if I didn't talk about them a little bit. While Mosaic didn't specifically have research goals um, to study polar bears themselves, because they are the apex predator of the system, um, and they rely on sea ice for habitat and hunting, they are gonna be directly or indirectly affected by um, by consequences for the sea ice itself, such as rapid melting and slower formation in winter, and then kind of secondarily affected by uh, the marine food web um, being altered by climate warming um, and how this loss of sea ice and, and its associated sea ice biota and sea ice algae um, might propagate up the food web uh, to affect polar bears. But um, the main reason we talked about polar bears during Mosaic was because they do pose a very real threat to both researchers and equipment. Um, so this image here shows two polar bears, um, a mom and a juvenile, playing with some of the flags set up around equipment um, outside of the polar stern. And this particular pair came back for several days in a row um, as much as uh, we tried to kind of scare them away because we don't, it's it's not good for them to get too um, habituated to being around people or activity um, and it wouldn't be safe to the researchers. So anytime that there were people out working on the ice, um, some of the most valuable members of the team were our polar bear guards um, who stood watch around the perimeter of the working area for hours on end, just scanning the horizon for polar bears. Um, and sounding the alarm or if any were coming uh, close enough that it could pose a, a danger to researchers. Um, so that's what this image is showing is a, a lone polar bear guard um, kind of in the polar twilight. So this was taken um, in early October. So we still had about four hours of this like twilight before um, polar night really set in. Um, so to conclude, um, sea ice is the most important driver of Arctic food webs and sea ice and the sea ice biota um, are at risk of disappearing from anthropogenic climate change. And because of this, mosaic research um, is super valuable to help identify vulnerable species um, and vulnerable connections among those species and ultimately will help improve predictions and mitigations to this warming. So I want to say um, a huge thank you um, both to uh, my virtual audience. Thank you guys all for coming. Um, and then also to uh, my funders and sponsors who enabled me to both join the Mosaic expedition um, and then act as a Mosaic ambassador for the last year where I um, have been able to do uh, a few different public talks for groups like this. Um, so with that, I would be more than happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carolyn. We really appreciate you presenting today. Um, this is the first time we've ever done a theme related to uh, the poles or the Arctic. So I think this is really exciting. Um, and I hope people are going to type their questions into the chat box. Um, like I said, this is one of the best parts about you know participating live in these webinars is that you get to have all your questions asked by the expert, um, which is something you don't get when you watch the recording. So um, definitely type your questions in. Um, I see one says, did anyone stay on board for the whole trip? No, no one, there were, it was broken down into six legs um, and the most any one person did was five. So he was on board for about 10 months. Um, and I don't know if this is true or not, but I heard through the grapevine that he said if he had been given his own room, he would have stayed for the entire expedition. Um, but everyone had at least one roommate on board the ship. 
Um, is there any chance you would share your slide deck uh, for the coaches to use with their students? Yes, I would be happy to. I can and make that available. Okay. Um, yeah, if you just send that to me um, up on the website where we had the link to the presentation today, we'll put the link to the recording as well as uh, the slides. Um, next question is what data sets or research topics are you most excited about from Mosaic? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, I'm still pretty excited about the ice core data. That was one of the um, initiatives I was involved in. So getting out to go and uh, map these ice flows and take these ice cores. Um, and so that publication I showed uh, that tracked the origin of the mosaic ice flow back to coastal Siberia. Um, I'm a co-author on that. And so some of our ice core data um, identifying sediment inclusions in the cores um, was really integral to that effort. Um, so that was really exciting to be part of one of the first publications from this huge expedition. What did it feel like to be in the Arctic? Oh gosh, I, I love going to the Arctic. This was my first time going to the Central Arctic and then also experiencing polar night. Every other time I've been, it has been during the summer um, when you get 24 hour light, which is, is also exciting. Um, but I just think there's something special and a little magical about going to this place that's so remote um, and so exposed to just like raw natural forces. Um, and, and another thing is really the camaraderie that develops among the researchers. You're in these pretty small, tight-knit groups, um, and that has also been just a joy to experience. How often did researchers have to evacuate or modify plans due to the polar bear sightings? Oh, that's a good question. Um, not very often. I don't, like, maybe, maybe a dozen times throughout the entire year. Um, and so it kind of as uh, happens in like groups, like I said, right um, at the beginning of the expedition that mom and baby polar bear I showed um, came back every day for like several days in a row. So then that was a little bit more disruptive, but then you would go for a few weeks or a month without seeing one. Okay, this is related. How were polar bears monitored during the polar night? That's a great question. Um, I guess the, sh the shortest answer is it's really hard. Um, I mean, we had expert polar bear guards who were out on the ice with um, binoculars looking. Um, and then on the ship itself, we also always had polar bear guards stationed on the bridge of the ship. So that's pretty high up. And so they would be looking out in every direction with binoculars, just scanning the horizon for bears. Um, and whenever operations were happening um, out on the ice that didn't like require all of the lights to be off, then the ship's lights would be on, um, kind of illuminating the ice so you could see a little bit further um, for polar bears. Um, but yeah, it was definitely uh, a risk and, and one that was mitigated well by the, the Mosaic safety team, but definitely still, um, you know, a risk. Okay, next one is, um, is there any evidence that ice extent gets smaller and smaller in fall each year, or is there any evidence that is having a harder time reforming as there's more open water? That's a great question. And yes, there, there is evidence that the, um, the ice during the fall winter freezing period is not returning to the concentrations of the previous years. Um, so I showed a data slide on that that you can, you can look at on my slide deck once I post it. Um, and so the, the data I showed was for the entire Arctic Ocean as a whole, um, but some of the coastal seas are experiencing this to a greater or lesser extent. So there's also data sets out there where you can look at it broken down by like basin within the Arctic Ocean and see these individual patterns. Okay, what is your favorite diatom and why? Oh, I love this question. Um, what's my favorite one? Um, probably Frigida Nichia, which I would say just because I really like the name. Um, but yeah, I don't know. That's a tough one. I, I really think all diatoms are so cool. Um, yeah. So I'm not, I'm not sure I have a great answer for that one. What was the eeriest part about acclimating to the Arctic? Um... I, I was surprised um, at how being in 24 hour darkness affected me. Um, 
like I said, I've been in 24 hour light before and I didn't feel like that affected me as much. But as soon as, you know, even though we kind of tried to maintain a normal sleeping schedule on board the ship, like as soon as we were in 24 hour darkness, it was like my internal clock just wasn't functioning properly. And I had a really hard time going to sleep at night um, and getting up in the morning. And I just, I did constantly feel like I was in a little bit of, of like a fog um, and I was, so I thought I was just getting really tired from, you know, working long hours. But then as we were motoring back, the second um, we had like the first sunrise, it was just like the fog was lifted. And I was like, oh, there's sunlight again. Uh, can you recommend any mosaic data sets that might be publicly available for teachers to use with students? Oh, um, yes. I don't remember the website off the top of my head, um, but I can I can give it to you um, along with my slides um, because there there are several kind of uh, smaller data sets that are out there that are um, available for teachers to use. Um, so I can make sure to get that information to you. I'll note on the NOSB's website we have a yearly resource page uh, related to the theme, and right now we do have Mosaic's education page up there as well as the University of Colorado. Boulder's um, mosaic education page. So you might be able to find some data sets there if you look. Um, let's see. Did slash will you ever send people to explore under the ice? Um, good question. So uh, I do not believe that there were any divers that like personally went under the ice during mosaic, um, but there were several um, autonomous um, or ROV um, like vehicles that were deployed under the ice. And so these are like little robotic, robotically operated vehicles that um, drive around and take images and video, but then also actually uh, sample under the ice. Um, and in, in other areas of the, of the Arctic, uh, people do dive under the sea ice uh, to collect samples, which um, is a pretty cool thing. I'm not sure I'm brave enough to do that, but uh, I think it's awesome that some people do. Will there be a Mosaic 2 or any attempts to compare data in the future? That's a great question. Um, I don't know of any plans to have a Mosaic 2, um, but as kind of the, the cruise leaders uh, were saying to, to me and some of my colleagues who are a little bit, you know, more early career scientists that, you know, the future is wide open and 10 years from now, maybe we'll be ready for another Mosaic. Um, but there are several previous expeditions that weren't quite as big in scope um, that Mosaic is able to compare our data to, to kind of get a like historical uh, view of how things have been changing. What was the most interesting, interesting, notable or memorable inclusion that you found in an ice core? Ooh, um, well, this in and of itself isn't, that interesting, but it was because of the implications of it. So I was expecting to see um, a lot more ice algae than we saw, and that's probably because we were taking the cores in September. So right when the the, the sea ice is kind of um, like beginning to form, and so the uh, ice algae hadn't really colonized it yet. Um, but finding sediment inclusions, which visually aren't that exciting, they're just you know look like dirt, um, was really exciting because it suggested that the ice flow had originated um, in a coastal zone, and so it turned out that it most likely originated off the coast of Siberia. Um, so that was cool. Are you working on putting together more publications from what you've collected on Mosaic? And what do you want to do next? Um, so I'm personally, I'm not working on more publications. The, that ice coring bit was kind of my, my research chunk. And now I'm acting as an outreach ambassador for the expedition. So um, I do have more uh, outreach plans for it. But um, now I've kind of switched gears back to um, my PhD. So I'm a PhD student at Dartmouth, um, where I'm studying geobiology of polar regions. Um, and so I'm doing a lot of lab work right now that is taking most of my attention at the moment. Um, you noted there are many sub subtopics that the research team studied throughout the expedition. Did you learn anything interesting from other researchers who were studying different facets of the Arctic? 
I did. That was probably one of my favorite parts um, because I really came into this with like an ecosystem and biogeochemistry background and focus, but we're all living and working on board a ship with all of the other disciplines. Um, so I learned so much about kind of atmospheric dynamics and the way um, like the sea ice and the atmosphere interact that I had never even heard of before and was so unfamiliar with. Um, and so it was really awesome to just get exposed to um, all of these other disciplines. And probably one of the neatest parts about going out to sea on these research uh, expeditions is that you have these like world famous scientists um, who are all like eating in the same cafeteria as you. And so it's really easy to just go up and like start a conversation with like some giant in your field. And, um, you know, it's just great to be able to, to learn from all these different people. Is anyone pulling together a film or video about the entire year? Yes, um, there, I think it's, I'm not sure if it's out yet, but there is an IMAX movie being created, and then there's also several um, smaller movies uh, in the works um, that I am not sure if they are finished yet, um, but if you check the Mosaic Expedition website, um, they have all of that information up there. Uh, one of the viewers said they teach at an all-girls high school, so they wanted to know what it was like being a female on such an isolated journey. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, you know, to to be completely honest, it was uh, it was a little bit multifaceted. Like on the one hand, this group that I was part of, the Mosaic Ambassadors, um, was mostly women, um, and we were all early career. But in terms of, so I was on one of the support icebreakers, the academic Fedorov, and of everyone on board, I think there were only two senior scientists who were women and the rest were all men. Um, and so there definitely is still a little bit of a machismo attitude among some people um, that is sometimes difficult to navigate as a woman and especially as a young woman. But I will say that um, especially among the early career people, just the camaraderie and support that the women scientists received um, from everyone um, was really great to see. And I hope a sign that things will continue to improve in the future. That's great to hear. Um, what impact do you think ocean acidification will have on the Arctic food web? That's a great question. Um, it's not something that I'm super well versed in, um, but I do know that a lot of the, I mean, as you probably know, the shelled organisms are, are most at risk. And um, there are some crustaceans that live in the sea ice who will probably be vulnerable to that. What was most surprising during the expedition? Um, let's see, there were, there were so many things that were surprising. Um, I, this was also, I was on a Russian icebreaker and I've only ever worked on American vessels before. So there were definitely a lot of, um, I don't know, surprises in that regard uh, where, you know, I like the, the food that we ate was so, I, I just loved being able to like try all these new food dishes so that I didn't know what they were. And um, a lot of times the menu was only posted in Russian, which I can't read. Um, so it was kind of always a surprise. You never knew quite what I was getting myself into when I woke up in the morning, um, but mostly good surprises. Regarding the polar night, did sleep schedules drastically change or was there a schedule that was able to be followed? Yeah, for the most part, we followed a schedule. Um, like all of the crew was very strictly on a schedule and worked in shifts, but um, all of the scientists um, could kind of like make their own schedules. Although the time out on the ice was um, very regimented and controlled um, by the captain just for safety reasons. Um, but we did have a ship-wide uh, alarm that went off every morning. Um, so every morning at 7 a.m. you'd get your call to breakfast. Uh, and depending on who was the person doing that, sometimes they would also put on some, you know, random music selection that would just be piped into your room via the, the ship radio um, in the morning. So that was always kind of a fun surprise to see what we'd wake up to. Were you also monitoring the age of the various ice flows you took samples from? 
Yes, that's a great question. So mostly we used uh, the thickness of the ice kind of as a proxy for the age, since we didn't know, um, we didn't really have a way of knowing exactly how old it was. Um, however, in the distributed network, one of the buoys that was set up is like an ice mass balance buoy. So it um, stayed out for an entire year, just measuring the ice growth as the, the water column froze um, beneath the ice and then the ice losses of ablation um, on the ice surface. And so we will have a year of continuous data kind of about ice growth and ice age processes. How optimistic are you about the future of the Arctic? Ooh, that's a tough question. I mean, I think I'm, I think I'm optimistic in that um, there's a lot of really smart, really dedicated people thinking and working about this. Um, that being said, I think the ecosystem almost certainly is going to change drastically in the next decade. Um, and so it really just remains to be seen um, how and, um, and I guess what mitigation, if any, is possible um, or appropriate to do. Um, next one is, I know polar ice is monitored as to how old it is, two-year ice, three-year ice, etc. Was the polar stern frozen near any ice older than one year old? Um, so that's a great question. Like I said, we don't know exactly how old the ice was, um, but I, it was probably around a year. And so yeah, this thicker multi-year ice is becoming more rare in the Arctic. Um, and so like I was saying in my presentation, it actually posed a huge challenge at the start of the expedition for finding a suitable flow to have the polar stern be frozen into because all of the ice was so much thinner than people were expecting it to be. What data concerned you the most? Do you have any idea of how much time we have until the ecosystem reaches a tipping point? Um, that's, that's a great question. I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, probably the data that's most striking to me is just the loss of sea ice extent each year. Um, I mean, we're, you know, they refer to an ice-free Arctic, um, which would mean when there's less than a million square kilometers of ice and we're inching closer and closer to that every year. I think the uh, most recent forecast I saw was um, uh, around 20 to 30 years until an ice-free Arctic. Um, so it kind of just remains to be seen what happens. After the team chose the locations for the ring of faces with different focuses or fo foci, I guess we would say, did any leads open or ice losses uh, cause equipment or stations to need to be moved around? Yes, great question. Um, and the answer is yes. So the ice is super dynamic. Um, and just because we've chosen to set up this ice camp to be there for a whole year doesn't mean the ice is going to cooperate. Um, so there were several times where leads or like a, a crack in the ice opened up that um, either made it un just unsafe to work or made it so that like loss of equipment was possible and things did have to be moved. What did you spend the most time doing, doing during the expedition? Sorry. What did you spend the most time doing during the expedition? Um, so my main job was to work with the ice flow mapping team and then the biogeochemistry team. So um, of the, let's see, I was at sea for six weeks for this and probably half of that time was just transit. So transiting out and then transiting back. But when we were actually on station and working out on the sea ice, main, my main job was to take ice cores. So I'd go out with a group of people, um, kind of find a few um, like, uh, like locations around the ice flow that looked interesting or might be representative of the flow. And then we would take a few different ice cores from each one um, and characterize them. And then back on the ship when we were transiting back, um, then I would work in the lab and we would section the ice cores um, and then melt the different sections and kind of prepare them to do different uh, chemical analyses on. Okay, this sort of ties in. How often did you find life on, in, or under the ice? Oh, all the time. I mean, it was a mostly microscopic. Um, so you didn't like, you couldn't confirm it until you looked at things under a microscope. Uh, but yeah, there's a ton, I guess on the ice, we didn't see very often except for when we saw, you know, polar bears or sometimes we'd see birds. Um, I'm definitely not an expert in birds, so I'm not gonna try to identify what they were. Um, but in terms of like microbial life in the sea ice, um, once we looked at it under a microscope, there was um, algae living in most of the cores. 
Let's see, when did you do your very first research project? Um, oh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I guess I started being involved in research when I was an undergraduate student. Um, my first time I went to the Arctic was um, in 2011, um, which was two years after I finished my undergrad. Um, and I was a technician on a project in Arctic Alaska, which is really what got me excited about polar science. And then I uh, decided to pursue a master's degree in um, Arctic marine science after that. And then um, in the intervening years since then, I've been working a little bit in Antarctica and now I'm kind of back to doing marine or Arctic stuff. Okay, one of the question was, had you been to Antarctica as well? So obviously, yes. Yes, I have. Although I was working on lakes in Antarctica, uh, not the ocean, which is another really wild environment. I feel like uh, it's the closest to being on Mars you can get to, to being um, point, to, while you're still being on Earth. I, I was in an area called the Dry Valleys, which is the, these like exposed rocky valleys with permanently ice covered lakes um, that can be like 70 feet deep. Um, and it was just a really wild otherworldly experience. How did you know you wanted to do geobiology rather than marine biology or physical oceanography? Yeah, I would definitely say that my interests have um, evolved over time and I kind of, you know, it's not a path that I ever would have like drawn 10 years ago, but it kind of has worked out <laughs> well the way it has. Um, and I see this pattern where I was always interested in using geochemical tools to answer kind of ecological and biological questions. So one of the, the main tools that I use in my research is called stable isotope analysis. And um, so during my master's, I, I used that type of analysis at kind of a, a macro ecosystem level in the Beaufort Sea, looking at um, food webs from crustaceans to fish to seals to polar bears. Um, and now I kind of look at the same type of interactions, but on a much smaller scale. So now I'm looking at microbial interactions. Um, how did mosaic itself affect surrounding life? Oh, that's a good question. Um, like all of the uh, infrastructure that we brought in and everything. Um, I guess the short answer is that we don't really know. Um, you know, I would say in terms of like, the, you know, probably the most immediate effect is uh, that, well, we did have to, uh, you know, scare away some polar bears so that they would not come near the ship anymore. Um, but yeah, I guess in the other aspect is that doing work in the Arctic, especially with icebreakers, um, you know, does come with a lot of, with a, with a pretty hefty carbon footprint. Um, so in that sense, um, you know, the ships themselves are definitely putting out emissions uh, into the atmosphere, which was being picked up by some of the um, atmospheric monitoring equipment. Um, and then just kind of, you know, in, in general, like this was a, uh, yeah, a carbon intensive expedition. Okay, earlier there was a question sort of asking about life on the ship and were you able to do normal things like take a shower? Um, great question. Yes, we were, we did have showers. So on the ship I was on, um, each stateroom um, had like two to four people in it. So I had two roommates um, and each stateroom had a bathroom and a small shower in it. Um, and so, yeah, we were able to do normal things like that. And I felt super lucky that we actually had a sauna on board the ship. Um, and so a few nights a week, we had like uh, either men's or women's sauna hours, which was so nice to come off, you know, a long day on the ice when my hands and feet would be numb and just be able to jump right into the sauna was so cool. I guess there have to be some perks, right? Like I always hear with the Navy that the submariners had the best food because if they were gonna be stuck in a submarine for months at a time, they at least wanted them to eat well. So <laughs> they even had like, you know, frozen ice cream machines. So <laughs> glad, <laughs> glad to hear you had a sauna. Yeah. Um, we have someone saying, thank you very much for sharing. They thought it was really interesting and educational. Oh, great. Um, another question, before you went in the ship, was there anything you had to do before uh, for instance, like after applying, having a complete um, exam, health screening, that sort of thing. Yes. So um, everyone uh, who was going to go and be part of the expedition um, had to pass a whole bunch of health screenings just to make sure that, um, or, you know, to hopefully like limit the chances of having some big medical emergency. Um, so yeah, dental and 
health uh, checks had to be passed. Um, and then depending on how long you're going to be out, you also had to do a whole bunch of different safety trainings. Um, so we spent about a week in Norway before my group went out doing uh, what's called dry days, uh, where we just attended safety briefings. And so those included things like um, like helicopter training and uh, and then also other ones that were um, like a little bit more soft skill oriented, like team dynamics and conflict resolution um, and just things of that nature to try to uh, like make it as unlikely as possible that something would go wrong on the expedition. Did you get to try on the survival suits? Yes, um, we, yep, we tried on the suits um, and then everyone uh, was also issued like a, a polar gear kit um, that had uh, like a, a down suit that you would wear out on the ice and um, like really warm, uh, boots to wear on the ice and like long underwear, gloves, hats, uh, that kind of thing. Um, I will note that I believe our third presenter um, in the series, um, Melinda Webster, for those of you who are asking about sort of like the medical tests and everything beforehand, I believe she's the one presenter who was on the expedition post the start of COVID. So you might have um, some interesting questions for her if you participate and that'll be on the the 25th. Um, let's see, I guess we can do our last question, um, which is what was the most difficult or challenging part of your experience? Oh gosh, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I think, I think like anything, you know, what makes it rewarding and what can make it challenging is interpersonal dynamics. And so for the most part, things were great on the ship, um, but um, I would say that, that there were some challenges, um, especially as relating to like gender dynamics on the ship. Um, and there, there's actually a great article published by uh, Chelsea Harvey in uh, Triple ES News about that, if you, if you want to look it up. But that um, kind of put a strain on the expedition um, in some ways. Um, but but overall, um, it was just a great experience and I'm really grateful to have gotten to be part of it, um, especially as an early career scientist. Um, you know, like not only did I get exposed to these cutting edge research techniques and get to meet these kind of uh, giants in the field, but I think it really helped like reinvigorate me um, that polar science is, uh, you know, an area of research that um, I think I want to pursue for the long haul. Well, thank you so much for your presentation. We have quite a few um, chats coming in saying thank you for your presentation. They found it very intriguing, eye-opening, um, and they enjoyed it. Um, I just let everyone know that, yes, what all the information that we talked about today that um, Carolyn will provide us, we'll post on her page under our webinar series that you can find it. Um, so yes, I'd like to thank you very much. We appreciate you taking the time to assist the NOSB. Um, and I can definitely tell, like I said, that this, uh, the polar theme is something that's very interesting um, and intriguing to people. Like you guys all had really amazing questions, which um, I thank you um, that you participated today and, and came with such great questions. I'm just gonna give you a quick update. Uh, we have two more presentations in this series. Um, on January 21st, we're going to, at 5 p.m. Eastern, we're gonna have doctors Bonnie Light and Maddie Smith and they're gonna present on the formation and importance of sea ice. Um, and then also on January 25th, like I said, Dr. Melinda Webster will present, that's gonna be at 7 p.m. And she's gonna talk about sea ice as well, but more in its connection to climate change. And she's gonna get a little bit into how the data is used in climate modeling. Um, so definitely join us uh, for those other two presentations. As I said, we did record this today. Uh, hopefully by tomorrow I'll be able to get it up on YouTube and we'll share it on Carolyn's webinar page at nosb.org um, and then you can share that link with your students. Um, please also share it with anyone that you might uh, think is interested in polar science. Um, once we get it up on YouTube we really want you to utilize it as much as possible um, and then you can go to the NOSB website as well as our social media. We'll be um, posting the links for the next two webinars as well. So we hope that you will be able to join us for those. Um, Great, well, thank you. Oh, I just got a note that it said, I invited some of my students for this. Um, yes, yeah, 
obviously, like I said, these presentations are done specifically for NOSB coaches, but we certainly want them to help the entire NOSB and education community. So yeah, please feel free to share the links. Um, the good thing is with our Zoom account, we can get up to 300 people. Um, we had close to 75 today, so that was great. Um, so yes, please share these as widely as um, possible. And we hope that everyone will join us again. And thank you again, Carolyn. Thank you so much for having me. Bye, everyone.